You're in a meeting called What is the DUP? Colin Bryce from, um, uh, from London now, but was previously a socialist um, in Derry in the north of Ireland for uh, some years. And um, he's going to introduce the meeting. He'll speak for about um, 30 minutes and then there'll be time for discussion and then he'll come back and sum up and we'll finish um, at the end. There'll be a couple of announcements before I bring him back to sum up. So, Colm. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jill. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is that, that, that okay? All right. Um, uh, it's been very strange. The last couple of weeks I've been asked uh, to go all over the country giving talks about uh, who, who are the DUP. And it's very strange because I've been, living in, uh, I've been living in England for about a year and a half now. I've been coming to Marxism probably for about 15 or 20 years. And I don't think in all that time anybody ever asked me who the DUP were. <laughs> not once. Not once. But now all of a sudden we're in this curious, curious situation where all of a sudden there's a spotlight on the DUP. And I think there's real shock among people. You know, so how can such a reactionary right-wing party with, um, with all its backward ideas, you know, so openly backward ideas on women's rights, on le uh, LGBT uh, right, rights and so on, on the environment uh, and, and all that sort of stuff. How can they be the people that are at the heart of, um, of for forming, uh, forming a, a new government? I mean, it's really interesting to even hear that debate, but I mean, this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, you look at the... The DUP have been in the British Parliament for the last 30, 40 years, and at every stage they have been on the side of opposing any uh, reform of the abortion laws, of do you know what I mean, of uh, of any uh, of any measures for for gay and lesbian equality. This has all been happening um, right right through uh, right through all that time. But I think one of the reasons why, and uh, yeah, it's it's funny now to see sort of so Nigel Dodds when there was some um, discussion about this about the the DUP's social attitudes and uh, uh, political attitudes, to these things. Um, got a bit, got a bit put out. You know, I sort of said, you know, people in the Tory party who are questioning what, you know, our position on lesbian and gay rights and all that sort of stuff, they need to show a bit of respect. Do you know what I mean? Like, we were very, very put out uh, by it. But it's, you see, it's an interesting thing, and, it, and it's an unusual thing for the DP themselves, but also more generally because I think the narrative, the dominant narrative in Britain, as it is in Ireland, about the peace process that's happening in the Northern Ireland and the troubles that that, that, that preceded it is this idea that, that what the Troubles was essentially about were these two tribes of people, Catholics on the one side who wanted to be the United Ireland, Protestants on the other who wanted to stay part of Britain. They just had a misunderstanding, they couldn't really get on, and the peace process has just been about getting them together and getting them to see each other, uh, the, the, the other side. But I, I think that's built on a lie. I think that's built on an absolute fundamental lie about how the Troubles came about, about what, you know, what its roots were in the partition of Ireland, the role of, of, of the British state and so on. But this is what we've been constantly told, that it's just about getting the hardliners of both sides together and that that's, that's really what, the, what, what's, what the, the essence of the peace process is about. There's a film out at the moment with Timothy Spall playing Ian Paisley. And it's, uh, uh, the premise of the film is that Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness are sitting on the back of a taxi on a journey and they're caught there and then they get on really, really well and they sort of, you know, sort of, and they, uh, you know, sort of get, get to know each other a bit better. And this is, uh, this is the, the way in which uh, the peace process has been framed. And for that reason, there hasn't been any discussion about the politics of, of, of the DUP or what the social attitudes of the DUP are. And also not, not, a, not much discussion about what the social attitudes of Sinn Féin or the SDLP are, because there's actually a lot of crossover there in terms of attitudes to uh, extending the 1967 Abortion Act to, 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 to the north of Ireland and so on, which I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll get into later. But uh, that narrative is something that I think we have to challenge, because I mean, I think the one, a friend of mine who's also living in Britain and was similarly inundated um, with questions after the election and after this deal was mooted, um, it was said that, you know, and trying to explain this to, 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 to people uh, living in England and his friends in England, who's saying, what you've got to grasp is that the DUP are the shadow left by British imperialism in the north of Ireland. That is what they are. You've got to grasp that. You can't understand why the DUP are now the largest party of unionism, uh, you know, sort of in government in the north of Ireland, or why they're, they're, they're in the British Parliament, why they've been hoisted up into that, in, into that situation without understanding the influence of British imperialism, uh, British imperialism in Ireland. And that's what I want to try. I want to try and trace some, some of that as well as talk about some of the, some of the, the actual um, 
uh, the actual history of where the DUP specifically comes from and its role in, in the troubles. But I also want to talk about um, I also want to talk about what the possible alternative is, the contradictions that exist in the DUP and, and, in, the, and, and in the political structures in the north of Ireland, uh, and, and what, what, what that alternative is, and what we might be able to what, what, that, what, what the conclusion that what conclusions that that leads to for people who are uh, for, for socialists who are based in uh, for, 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 for based, based in uh, based in Britain. Do, uh, when after the election, the first speech that Theresa May uh, gave outside Downing Street, she, uh, she, uh, she used the phrase to describe her party as the Conservative and Unionist Party. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's kind of unusual to hear them saying it, but that is the official name of the, of, of, of the Tory party. And it's important for us to really, you know, to see that that relationship between the British establishment and British political parties and what has developed and what has gone on at all the crucial turning points in, 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 in Irish history, especially, especially over, over, the, over the last hundred years, is really the explanation as to why, as to why, uh, why, why the, the DUP are who they are and why, why they have been, uh, why, why they have been un, not only unchallenged but also, uh, but, but also raised uh, to, to, to this position. To understand, so the, the, the birth of the Troubles in the late 1960s was, began with the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and it begins with a civil rights movement that based itself and took inspiration from the black civil rights movement in the, in, in the United States. Because of the history of, no, uh, of the north of Ireland, because every threat to the state was uh, tarred with the idea that this is just a Republican plot for, uh, for United Ireland, that civil rights movement, the leadership of that civil rights movement, deliberately and very consciously avoided raising the question of the border, raising the question of, of United Ireland. They said we're out for equal rights uh, uh, and so on, for an end to the discrimination um, that was intrinsic to the Northern Ireland state, the discrimination against Catholics and so on, and just were, 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 uh, and just were out for e uh, e equal rights. Ian Paisley, the founder of the DUP, was the organiser of the the vicious physical reaction to, to, to that movement. We've got to understand this. This wasn't just about sort of opposing the demands of the civil rights movement, say, in Parliament or, or, or in local councils. Paisley was the key, one of the key instigators, along with people who were in the actual Northern Ireland government, people like William Craig and so on, of organising physical force to physically confront uh, the, uh, to physically confront the civil rights movement and also to goad the Northern Ireland state and the British state into taking ever firmer measures against, uh, against the civil rights movement and the rebellion that, the, that, that developed in, 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 in Catholic areas uh, and so on. To, gi to give you an idea of what that, of what that meant, um, at an early stage in the civil rights movement, uh, late 1969, um, uh, a bunch of the radicals and the radical left, uh, mainly based in Belfast, but involving people like Michael Farrell, Emma McCann, Bernadette Devlin, and so on, organised the march from Belfast to Derry, to, or in order, like, like based on the uh, on the Selma to, to Montgomery march that happened in, in the United States in the civil rights movement. This was their, they, what they wanted. What they said they were out to do was to try and draw attention to how how blatant the discrimination was uh, across the north of Ireland. Part of it was also to sort of, you know, provoke and show to the eyes of the world the violence that they were that that that, that be, they be met with, and in that way raise uh, ra raise uh, raise support. At every stage, they were opposed by Paisleyite mobs. And when the when the march got close to Derry the night before, Ian Paisley addressed a mass meeting in uh, in the Derry Guildhall, um, saying that this march must be opposed. The following morning, hundreds of people assembled in the fields around a place called Burntollet Bridge, about three miles out, uh, outside of Derry, uh, on, on the fields sort of uh, uh, above the road. That crowd was made up of members of the B-Specials, the Reserve Police Force that was largely recruited and formed out of the Ulster Volunteer Force when, when, when the Northern Ireland State was set up, and so on, off-duty uh, policemen, uh, and, uh, and so on. The police took that march into that ambush and stood aside whenever, whenever they were attacked with cudgels and sticks and rocks and so on and beaten the whole way, uh, beaten, uh, the, the, the whole way into Derry. This was, what, this was Paisley's modus operandi. At every civil rights march, civil rights marches in Newry and all that sort of stuff, what Paisley would do is organise four or 5,000 people to go and occupy the centre of the town, to stop the civil rights march uh, coming into it, to force the police uh, to, 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 to block the civil rights march, the Bloody Sunday March in Derry. It's a big, um, huge march, um, 
that ended in the, ca- in the, in the massacre of, 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 of innocent people on, on that march by the British Army. But the day of that march, Ian Paisley and Gregory Campbell, who's now an MP and, uh, and so on in the DUP, organised a counter-protest to occupy the Guildhall Square to prevent the marchers uh, getting there. Um, th- th- this, is what, th- th- this is what Paisley, uh, this is what Paisley uh, uh, set out to do. And you see, this, as the troubles developed and intensified, this became the rationale for loyalist param- paramilitarism. They said that, you know, so the state sometimes, there's a big element of, uh, of Ulster Unionism that is constantly worried that they're going to be stabbed in the back by the British government, that the British government's not going to be firm enough in, in, in taking on uh, any, ch- any challenge to the state. And therefore, you've got to organise outside of the structures, put pressure on the structures of the state and so on in order to do it. But always, and this is the thing that's, that's been exposed more and more, in the, in the last 10, 10 or 20 years, always with this intimate collusion between the forces of, of loyalist par- paramilitarism, unionist politicians, and the police force, and the British Army. And you see this uh, time and time again. So it's very interesting and very significant that one of the elements of the DUP dealing with the Tories, one of the demands of the DUP, and May has acceded to this, is to say that the prosecution of former police uh, officers, former soldiers, and so on, for, uh, uh, for murder uh, in, uh, in, in the north of Ireland during the course of the Troubles has gone too far, and we need to, uh, um, and we need to push it back. It's a deliberate and very conscious attempt to, uh, to cover over the, 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 involvement, uh, the involvement of the state in, uh, in, 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 in the Troubles, and so on. This is a very, very serious movement at, 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 at different times. In the, sort of around the time of the, of the hunger strikes, at every moment of uh, challenge and uh, 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 resistance to the Northern Ireland state, and the 1981 hunger strikes, in which Bobby Sands and, and uh, nine other people died, provoked an enormous wave of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of sympathy for, for, for the hunger strikers, 100,000 people at Bobby Sands' uh, funeral uh, and so on. There were never 100,000 people in the IRA, but there was, a, do you know what I mean? There was only ever, ever a, a few hundred. But the enormous sympathy uh, for people to see that injustice meted out by the, by, by the Tory government was a real challenge and a real threat to the, uh, to, to, to the Northern Ireland state. What was Paisley's reaction? Paisley's reaction was to organise, openly organise, a, 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 a series of, of different groups, but a group called Ulster Resistance, in which him and Peter Robinson, future leader of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the DUP, appeared with red berries and so on, big rallies in, in, in Belfast, Palomina and all that sort of stuff, uh, appearing on mountainsides in the, in the middle of the night, inviting journalists to sort of, you know, and saying everybody was waving uh, arms licenses, you know, 500 men, you know, sort of in, 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 in Newton Arge, you know, waving um, uh, firearms licenses, saying, we are prepared to take the action that the government, the government's not prepared, uh, prepared to take uh, to go and, and, and crush, the, uh, crush, crush uh, the, the, the resistance. This is, all, you know, this is not just ancient history. I mean, it's very interesting. The DUP uh, recently won the seat of South Belfast, and the candidate was a woman called Emma Little Pengeli, and she was openly endorsed by the Ulster Defence Association. Uh, and the thing, there was a bit of a scandal about it, you know, the fact that she was o- so openly endorsed by it. Emma Little Pengelly's father is Noel Little, who was the key second in command of Ulster resistance. He was caught, and this gives you an idea of where the DUP situate themselves in the world. He was caught trying to do an arms deal um, to smuggle arms in, uh, into the north of Ireland for loyalist paramilitaries. They did actually have a massive arms shipment that went in and was divided out between Ulster resistance, the UDA, and the Ulster Vol- Vol- Volunteer Force. But he was caught trying to do a deal with Israeli and South African arms dealers, and the deal that, the, and the, the terms of the deal was that in return for the arms, Noel Little would, would give them uh, weapons uh, technology smuggled out of Short's aircraft factory in, uh, in the east of Belfast in Peter Robinson's constituency. That, this was the ter- the, the, these, these were the terms, of the, ter- the, the, the terms of the deal. And that is, that who's, uh, that's who Emma Little Pengelly's uh, father uh, is. I've never been denounced by the uh, by, 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 the, by, by the DUP. So that, and this is very interesting, just when you talk in that story and the relationship, say, between, say, Shorts, uh, who not just man- man- manufacture aircraft, but manufacture missiles in the in, in East Belfast factories and so on, very well-paid, skilled jobs in, in Peter Robinson's constituency. Another one of the demands 
that the DUP had in the, in the deal they did with the Tories was to increase defence spending to 2% uh, to of, of GDP with, a, with an idea that some of that defence spending, spending on weapons, would come to the north of Ireland and that that's the way that they would, uh, that's, that, that's the way that they would be uh, boosted. So all those connections with loyalist paramilitaries, with nor uh, uh, cap uh, uh, nor nor northern capitalists and, uh, and so on, are all ve are very, very intimate, all very, very intimate uh, 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 sort of re uh, relationships. What Paisley did in forming the DUP, Paisley formed the DUP at the moment at which the crisis had got so bad after Bloody Sunday uh, for the, the Northern Ireland state and so embarrassing for, for, for the British government that they collapsed the Stormont government that they had prepared, they had turned a blind eye to since 1921 when they formed the Northern, Northern Ireland state, but they collapsed uh, that parliament. That is the moment at which P Paisley formed the, uh, the, 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 the DUP. Um, and the DUP really grew out, they understand its history, really grew out through all those networks that we're talking about that were involved in that movement that Paisley was bringing, uh, bringing on, on, onto the streets. It was really a coalition of um, rural evangelical Presbyterians, very, very religious, typical, you know, sort of religious fun fundamentalist things, normal, normal, uh, an awful lot of parallels and actually direct connections with religious uh, uh, fundamentalists in, in the southern states of, of America. Bay Paisley got his doctorate from the Bob Jones University, which was notorious for excluding black people uh, and uh, all, 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 that, all that sort of stuff. A coalition between them and then an urban base that was really based, built up by, uh, by people like, like, like Peter Robinson, who's a former real estate agent, you know, sort of a pe classic petty bourgeoisie, but a mass populist base in, in, in urban areas of, um, uh, of, uh, of places like Belfast, based on, you know, sort of a resentment against the civil rights movement, against, resentment against republicanism and an anti-Catholic uh, an anti uh, sort of uh, pop populism, and that's what they did. But in doing that, the DUP were drawing on some very, very deep roots of sectarianism in Ireland. Sectarianism, for anybody who doesn't understand the term, sectarianism is really the, the, the uh, conflation of religion and politics. It's to say religion, whatever your religion is, is should be the same uh, as your politics, so that, 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 the two, that, that, that the two are meshed. This has been the history of what happened in Ireland um, and so on, and the different movements um, that were formed in order to uh, try to resist uh, the anti-colonial and independence movement uh, in, in Ireland, uh, have, have their roots in, 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 that, in, that, in that sectarian, in that, in that, in that sectarian uh, mentality. Protestants in, in, in Ulster, where, where there was a, the plantation that happened in the 1600s, 1700s and so on, and very much were encouraged to have that frontier planter settler uh, mentality, you know, so you see Derry's walls, you know, so the wall, you know, the, wall, the walls in Derry, you, you see, that the, 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 they're building the walls there to keep the natives out, the rebels, the people who are going to come to attack them. This is where the Protestants and the settlers could, could, could come and find, uh, could come and find uh, uh, so, some safety. Um, and this, is what, this is still what, why the apprentice boys of Derry march every 12th of, uh, every 12th of August and say that they are continuing the tradition of the people who closed the gates and didn't give in and didn't compromise, you know, sort of when the, when, 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 when the city was on, on, under attack from a, from, from, from a Catholic king. This is that, that sort of, that settler colonial uh, mentality is something that has been uh, developed and encouraged and nurtured uh, all the way through the history, all, all, all the way through the history of Ireland. It's never been that straightforward this is always a result of political movements uh, uh, and so on. The formation of the Orange Order, for example, only takes place in the late, uh, uh, in the late um, uh, uh, 17, uh, early 1790s in response to the explosion of, uh, uh, of movements in, in Ireland inspired by, by the French Revolution and the formation of the United Irishmen, uh, led by people like Wolfe Tone, who are Presbyterians, uh, in, 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 in Belfast, and, uh, inspired by those, by, by those radical ideas, who said that they were out to create a, a republic of Catholic, Protestant, and, and dissenter, and, uh, and to break the connection with England, the, the, uh, the never-ending source of all, of, of, all our, of, of all our ills. The Orange Order was formed, and deliberately formed, as a reactionary force in order to try and smash uh, the, the unity of that movement and physically confront it and support the, and support the, British, uh, the British state in actually um, uh, su suppressing that rebellion. That's the origins of the, of the Orange Order. That's the sort of tradition 
that Paisley uh, harks back to. That tradition sort of died out. It was no longer useful after the, the, the rebellion had, had, had been smashed. After, actually, after the Act of Union, in which the, because Presbyterians in, in, in the north of Ireland were, had been discriminated uh, uh, against as well by the, by, 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 the, by, the, uh, by the establishment and so on. In the Act of Union, they passed a series of laws that discriminated against Catholics and you know, sort of included Presbyterians in, in, in that law in order to try and smash that. So there was no need for uh, big orange marches and so on until Belfast and Derry and places like that became industrial centres in the 1850s, 1860s and so on as part of the Industrial Revolution. Marx writes about this in, uh, in, in Capital. He talks about how the, the Irish famine of the 1840s drove thousands of people uh, in, 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 into the cities, fleeing uh, the, the, the poverty and hunger in the, in the towns, and created the raw material for a proletariat that could be exploited um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and fuel the Industrial Revolution and textile shipbuilding and, and all these sorts of things. This, but this created a danger for the people who ran all, 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 those in, uh, all those industries, a danger of trade unionism, radicalism, and so on taking hold. They deliberately encouraged the reformation of the Orange Order in order to try, try and head off that, uh, that unity. And, the, and the, the various unionist movements, the Orange Order and so on, time and time again, at those, when, those, when there have been those movements when there has been class unity and joint uh, common class struggle between Protestant and Catholic workers, time and again the, the, the Orange Order has been used in order to in order to smash that and in, in order to break that and in order to drive people back into those uh, back, back, in, back into those uh, back into those two camps but this is not something that just happened in uh, in Ireland itself and, and just happened sort of isolated from what was happening in, in, in England actually the what, what the, that development of an orange movement, the development of an armed movement against the demands for home rule in the early part of the in the early part of the, the 1900s, was something that was deliberately fostered by the by, by the Tory government. The Tories were not, weren't the dominant party; weren't they automatically the dominant party of British capitalism. It was a liberal uh, it was a liberal party, and in order to try and win a majority in uh, in the British Parliament. The Tories went out of their way to ally themselves with, with, with the Unionists uh, of Ulster. Edward Carson, um, you know, sorry, who was mentioned, Jerry Carroll mentioned him, mentioned him last night, the guy who prosecuted, uh, prosecuted uh, Oscar Wilde and so on, and put himself, I mean, Paisley models himself on Carson, the sort of movement that Edward Carson, you know, sort of organised, you know, organised a mass movement, armed them, ship, uh, gun running and all that sort of stuff. But Carson was a part of the British establishment, the Ulster Covenants that, hundred, that tens of thousands of people signed to say we are going to oppose Home Rule, some of them signed it in blood, you know, to say we, we will, uh, we will uh, fight to the last drop of our blood to, to stop home, home Rule for uh, Ireland, was drawn up in a conservative gentleman's club in Mayfair in, in London. That's, that, that was where it was, it was drawn up and then brought to the north of Ireland and a movement built around it. Boner Law, who was the leader of the Tory party, came and addressed mass rallies with Carson in Belfast and so on and said, we will stand with you, we will, uh, we, we will not let uh, ho Home Rule go through and we are prepared to allow anything to happen. You know, so when it comes to ho Home Rule, we can't just obey normal par parliamentary politics, we, we, uh, we will not stand in the way of the resistance uh, of the northern people. And this gave a signal to the British garrison, based at the Curra uh, ar ar army camp at, the, uh, at that time, to say, uh, and the, uh, the generals and the, uh, the senior officers there openly, this before the First World War, openly said, we will not physically confront the Ulster, the, the Ulster Unionists if they take up arms uh, to, 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 to stop home rule, an uh, uh, open mutiny. The, that's the way in which that orange reaction, the UVF and so on, were all sort of built, built up. And this, comes, this is a culmination of this is then with the partition of Ireland in response to that huge explosion of uh, rebellion, strikes, and so on. You know, the, the strikes and the, the common working class struggle that like happened in 1919 of Catholic and Protestant workers and so on, all written out of history. But this tremendous rebellion uh, against uh, the horrors of war and so on was headed off and deliberately headed off by the British government by imposing partition and putting 
the Carsonites putting the, the UVF uh, and so on and, uh, and the Orange Order into the government in, in North of Ireland and saying, this is now, now your territory. And all the horrors of discrimination that dominated the Northern Ireland state, the sectarian police force, as Lord Brookborough said, the Protestant state for a Protestant people, all of that follows from deliberate, uh, for, for, from deliberate uh, Tory, Tory party uh, policy and, was, and it has to be said, was continued by, uh, by, 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 the Labour party, uh, by the Labour Party as well. Uh, just to, to come back, back up, up to date, though, there's, there, or come back from sort of modern era, there is uh, one of the things that has changed, you see, is that, and it's one of the things that I think when the, the unionist, um, the splits in unionism are all often over this question of the fear of treachery by, 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 by British governments. That's, that's a continual thing. That, this is how Paisley made his... Made, made, uh, it was part of Paisley's, uh, part of Paisley's appeal. They, they might backslide on, on us. We have to be prepared to arm ourselves and, and, and do the job and, and do, do, do the job ourselves. But, of course, the interests of the British establishment, the British ruling class, is not about protecting the interests of the Protestants of, of the north of Ireland. It's all, always been about their own interests, their interests in the empire and so on, their relationships with the United States. And all of this has changed over time. It changes on, on, the, on the basis of shifts and change, changes in, in economy. So from the 1950s, 1960s onwards, Britain's role and Britain's determination to hold on to the, to, to the north of Ireland had begun to change. The, the, the economic relationship with the south of Ireland became much more important to the, to, to, to the, British, uh, to the British capitalist class. There was a, a, a really steep decline in all the heavy industry that was based, uh, that, that, that was based in Belf Belfast, the textiles, the ship, shipbuilding, and so on. Britain acknowledged sort of from the 1840s or the 1940s onwards that it was really bailing out no the, the, the north of Ireland. It was subsidising the, 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 the existence of that state rather than that being you know, a source of, you know, one of, the, one of the key places in the empire. And this begins to shift British policy in, 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 in the north of Ireland. This is why the same Margaret Thatcher, who was determined uh, to, see, to see the hunger strikers day, who was, you know, sort of uh, took on, you know, so the, 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 the Republican movement, the armed, uh, you know, and uh, sent in the army and all that sort of stuff, was, still this, was also the same Prime Minister who in 1986 signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which is an agreement between the Southern Irish government and the British government to say that there should be some joint interest in running, running the north of Ireland. You know, the, the, the basis of it was to say that the Southern Irish government had an interest in protecting the interests of the Catholics in the north of Ireland. The British state had an interest in protecting, you know, sort of the inter in, in looking out for the uh, uh, interests of the Protestants, and that there should be some cooperation with that. Paisley's response to this was to organise, and the, the, the whole of Ulster Unionism, was to organise mass rallies, attempt to organise strikes and so on, like they'd done in 1974 against the power-sharing uh, government and so on. You know, those famous things when he stood in front of Belfast City Hall dressing hundreds of thousands of people and said, Ulster says no and never, never, never. You know, that, that, that was Paisley's reaction was always to, you know, sort of to, to organise organize that movement and see that, 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 that potential of uh, the treachery. And that this is, you see, this is also then what happens with the peace process. Paisley's immediate reaction to the peace process that began to develop, you know, sort of with the, when the uh, Republican movement, when the IRA realized that the military struggle, which had narrowed down the, uh, the, the, the struggle that had emerged in the late 60s and the, and, and the, early, uh, and the early 70s, and the purely, and almost purely um, m military struggle, uh, and that was, and wasn't getting anywhere, as en entered a cul-de-sac, when they tried to open up relationships and discussions with the British government, the Southern Irish government, the American uh, government, and all that sort of stuff, Paisley just banged the drum and said, this is the sellout, this is the sellout, this is the sellout, we told you it was coming and so on, we need to org organize to, uh, to resist. What's very interesting is that Paisley was marginalized when, when, when it came to that. He was pushed to the margins of a very famous scene when they were just doing the final uh, deals of it, the final uh, you know, few days of signing the Belf Belfast Agreement. Paisley tried to lead another march up, up, up to Stormont to say, we oppose this, you know, sort of, you know, it was like a torchlit procession in the evening and all that sort of, all, all, all very dramatic. Very, very small, though, by, Pais by, by Paisley's standards. And when he got into the buildings, 
and got in to give a press conference, he was openly challenged by people who were former loyalist prisoners who openly said to him, you've led us up the hill far too many times and you never did anything for work, working, class, working class Protestant people. Go away, you're not wanted here anymore, and so on. And it was a real, you could see he was really taken aback by this. Something had shifted, uh, something had sh shifted in the ground. The overwhelming feeling of people wanting to end the, the violence uh, 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 and so on, was the, was the thing that pushed it, pushed it forward. Paisley continued, though, so he was, he was pushed to the side. The Ulster Unionist Party and so on took the leadership uh, of, 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 of unionism and so on when, when the agreement was signed. But Paisley was able to rebuild his strength um, uh, by saying, you see, the agreement... And it was, I, th I think it was encouraged by this because the agreement was constantly in crisis with David Trimble and the Ulster Unionist Party demanding more IRA decommissioning, demanding, demanding the IRA recognise the police and uh, all these sorts of things, constantly in crisis. And all of this, far from heading off a threat from Paisley, actually only encouraged him to say, we are the people who have been saying this from day one. We said there has to be decommissioning, we, we said there has to be uh, all, all, all these conditions. And that is the way in which uh, Paisley pulled and, or, or developed uh, the resentment that existed amongst working class Protestants at the, at the very, very poor uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, fruits of the, uh, of, of, the, of, the peace, uh, of the poor, of the peace process and directed it on to Republicans, uh, Republicans and Catholics. But the key turning point that happened when Paisley did enter the government uh, was this. Tony Blair was in government at that time. Blair said that, that he sat down in negotiations with uh, Paisley and the way he put it to him, the DUP had become the largest party, and therefore it was another crisis in the peace process to say, well, how, how can we form a government the largest party won't take part in the joint uh, government? The key thing that Tony Blair promised Ian Paisley was to say, I won't introduce uh, and extend the 1967 Abortion Act to the north of Ireland. I won't introduce uh, equal marriage for, for, for lesbian and, and, uh, and gay people. Um, if you take part in the, in the peace process, I, I will give you complete control over those social and moral issues, and that therefore you, you, you will be able to stop uh, all, all, all those things. Absolute disgraceful, you know, sort of selling out of the interests of women, of lesbian and gay people in the, in the north of Ireland, a cynical deal made by Tony Blair, and that is the crucial thing that, that Paisley held on to, that he, he held up as saying, this is no matter what else, I mean, he could see the ground has shifted, that there had to be some sort, sort of power sharing, but that was the thing that he was able to hold up to his supporters and, and, and the DUP and to say, this is what we've achieved. We will, we will be able to block, uh, we will be able to block uh, all, 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 all those things. The thing I want to finish on, though, is a question of the contradictions of the DUP, because there is a massive contradiction. Working class Protestants in the north of Ireland are not voting for the DUP because of their reactionary, uh, because of their, 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 their reactionary politics. I think this has to be grasped, it has to be understood. A recent survey said that 75% of people in the north of Ireland, that is Catholics and Protestants, want to see reform of, of, of the abortion law in, in, in the north of Ireland, want to give uh, w w women, uh, w w women the right to choose. The way in which and so, and, and a whole series, a whole host of other, uh, other issues, uh, working class Protestants are far more, are far more, uh, far more progressive than than the, than than the people who uh, than the people who, who who lead the DUP. But what the DUP do uh, with that? A very interesting episode where Peter Robinson, who was the first minister in the north of Ireland, you know, sort of seemed to, and the DUP seemed to be the, the biggest party of unionism and so on, he lost his seat in East Belfast, this heartland seat of the, uh, of the DUP, to Naomi Long from the Alliance Party, who you describe as a sort of liberal unionist party. You know, they describe themselves as a liberal party where, where for, you know, equal uh, rights for both sides and so on, and uh, sort of model themselves on, on a liberal party. A really shock election result that he, that he lost that seat that he, that he held, held for ages. And that, I think, that indicates the fact that people are not tied. Do you know what I mean? That they're not tied to, 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 to the DUP. It's absolutely wrong to write off working class Protestants as simply died in the world reactionaries, you know, sort of who, will, who will never vote, vote any different. But what was Robinson's reaction to that? What was Robinson and the DUP's reaction to that? They went around and delivered 40,000 leaflets in every door in East Belfast saying, did you know that the Alliance Party in Belfast City Council had agreed with a Sinn Féin proposal to only fly the Union Jack on Belfast City Hall instead of every day, only on the Queen's birthday, and I forget what the, what the other day was. Did you know that this is what the Alliance Party had done? They're taking our flag from us. 
What are you going to do about it? And this unleashed months of protests about we want our flag back up in Belfast City Hall, the Republicans are getting everything for us and so on. Peter Robinson won the seat. The, or, or the DUP won, won, won the seat back from the Alliance Party. This is the sort of thing that the DUP can constantly do because, and this is tied up with the fact that the Northern Ireland government now is being squeezed harder and harder and harder to impose austerity uh, in, in, in the North, to impose all the welfare cuts and so on, all of which affect working class Protestants and Catholics. They can't deliver anything tangible to people. They can't deliver the jobs that they were able to secure in, in, in the past. But what they do do is sort of hold up the symbols of identity, of Protestant identity, and, and direct the resentment in working class Protestant areas to, to say the Catholics are getting everything. The peace process is about giving the Catholics everything and you're, uh, and you're losing out and building, and building right wing movements on, on, the, on, on that basis. The, the, the hope in the north of Ireland is that working class Protestants and Catholics come together and see their, com and see their common interests. This is possible in the, in the north of Ireland. Just in the space of the last four or five years, the pension strikes that took, took place in, in 2011 were equally as big and well supported, and the demonstrations were absolutely massive in, in, in the north of Ireland, in, in the centre of Belfast, bringing together working class Protestants and Catholics on the basis of their, of their common interests at, at work. You've got to understand that the education system educates Catholics and Protestants in separate schools now. Overwhelmingly, and this has gotten worse since the start of the peace process, overwhelmingly Catholics and Protestants live in uh, uh, neighborhoods and areas that are dominated by one religion r r rather than the other. That, that separation and segregation has actually deepened, uh, has actually deepened, uh, uh, deepened and got worse. Where people work together, or where people are together, is, is when they're at work. It makes it even more crucial uh, and even more important when, 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 when people come together. And there's been a very important thing right throughout the Troubles. It's something that's always written out, written out of, the, of how peace came about in the north of Ireland. Time and again, in response to sectarian murders in the, in the 1990s, the trade unions pulled together and called massive demonstrations for peace in, 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 in the city centres, which are overwhelmingly, uh, which are overwhelmingly supported by tens, of, by, by, by tens of thousands of people. The great tragedy of it is that those same union leaders, the only alternative that they, they had to propose was to say, I still remember standing in Belfast City Hall with Daniel, after Daniel McCall and a young postal worker had been killed, and, the, and the, the postal workers in Belfast and across the north just walked out and kept marching every, every, every day to say, we want this UDA uh, camp, murder campaign called off. The big rally that was eventually called by, by, by the trade unions the way, in, the way in which they pitched it was to say, isn't this great to see everybody out in the streets? It's very, very important. And it did call off, that, the, 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 and it did uh, bring an end to that, that particular murder, murder campaign. But the way the union leaders pitched it was to say, now let's hope and pray. And they had a Catholic you know, sort of, uh, priest and a Protestant clergyman on the, on the platform as well to show their you know, sort of hands across the divide. Let's hope and pray that our political leaders sat up at storm and can get round the table and work out, and, and, and work out uh, so, so, some sort of agreement and let's, all, and, and, and let's all go back to work. And this is what happens time and time again. It's a huge public sector strike against the threat of austerity, uh, uh, the austerity budget, what was it, 18 months ago, two, two, two years ago that, that, that was introduced. Again, an enormous outpouring of, uh, 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 of action, people taking strike, strikes, massive demonstrations and so on. The union leaders saying, this is only the beginning. We will have a determined campaign to stop any of this being, being brought to the north. But what happens? The union leaders called off that, that, uh, that, 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 that movement because they said, if we go too far, we'll bring down the, uh, the, storm and, uh, the, the, the storm of parliament and we'll then have direct rule by the Tories and that'll, and, 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 and that'll be terrible. Basically what the, what, what the Sinn Féin uh, line was saying. It was a terrible cowardice and terrible retreat which then leaves the, leaves the space open when there's not that working class action, that joint working class action, leaves the space open for those politics of resentment uh, to, grow, uh, to grow and fester. And I think it has to be said that, you see, I think the electoral victory by Jerry Carl and what people before profit have done uh, in Belfast and, uh, and in Derry the, the last while, I think really points the way to the alternative tradition that, 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 uh, that, that can provide, uh, that, that, that can provide an, uh, an, an, alternative, uh, an alternative to this. That you, we need, uh, I said, need radical politics that talks about class unity, that said class is the, is the main divide in society, and that we need to, to connect that to a vision of a radically different 
Ireland, North and South, a united Ireland that is, uh, is on a fundamentally different basis. Republicanism and nationalism in, in, in Ireland over the last 100 years has proven itself unable to win any significant section of, the, of, of working class Protestants to, to its goal because time and again, because the military strategy hits, a, hits the barriers, hit, hits a cul-de-sac, it has retreated into saying its vision of a united Ireland is simply the extension of the Southern Ireland state to, 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 to the Northern Ireland state. Now, that, what, that and, and what that has always done is never undermined the idea that put about by Paisley and so on, that the south of Ireland is a Catholic priest-ridden country, the backward ideas and all that sort of stuff we need to defend, we need to defend our, our, northern, our, our northern state. Now it means that, unfortunately, tragically, Sinn Féin, so many of the, the, the people who, who fought in the Republican struggle, who'd always described themselves as socialists, now their official position is to say that the way we'll get a united Ireland is by convincing the union as business class that it's in their interests to join a united Ireland to uh, avoid the implications of Brexit, uh, to lower corporation tax rates to the same as what it is in the south and turn it into a tax haven, a low wage, uh, a low wage uh, tax haven. This is not a vision that's ever going to convince working class uh, working class Protestants to join, join the struggle for, for a socialist Ireland. And that's why I think it's a great tribute to Jerry and people before profit in, in Ireland, north and south, who are fighting both governments and fighting for a different vision of, of Ireland on all those issues about a woman's right to choose uh, a l lesbian and gay rights and openly taking on sectarianism, but basing, uh, but, uh, uh, basing itself on, on the prospect of, of class unity. That's the politics that we need to challenge and ultimately break apart that contradiction that exists uh, that exists with, with, within unionism, the fundamental class divide that, 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 that exists there, uh, that we see, see in so many different ways. It takes socialist uh, organization uh, and, and, and so on that's involved in the daily struggles uh, of people in, in, in order to do that, but we need to marry that to a vision of a socialist Ireland. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we've got time now for um, discussion. People um, who want to speak um, and make a contribution or ask a question, if they indicate, I would ask if they could come up to the microphone because the meeting is being taped. Um, people can speak for three minutes. After two minutes, I'll tap on the microphone and then um, if you could start to sum up so we can get as many people in as possible. I'll take the person there. If you keep your hands up while I just write these down. Uh, I suppose it's that time of year again, isn't it? In a few days, if, um, if there's anyone here from uh, the six counties that's thinking about maybe extending their holiday for another f extra day, so you don't have to go back to those awful parades and so on. But I'd, something I didn't know was that uh, BBC Northern Ireland show the Orange Parades live every year. I only kind of found that, I think it's only since the DUP have been involved, you know, in terms of the deal and so on, that I found that out. And I saw a, an article um, where it quoted the, what are they called the leaders of the lodges? Like they're grand wizards or something. What are they? Grand masters? What, what, uh, grand masters at the lodge. It, it was interviewed and he said something like, he said, um, he said, this will be an opportunity for us to show the wonderful, colourful parades and the ex exciting calibre of music, as if it was like Notting Hill or Glastonbury or something like that. Do you know what I mean? The way it's been kind of uh, 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 put over. Um, I, just want, I just want to ask a couple of, um, couple of questions, really, because I, you kind of touched on it, but just a little wee, wee bit more uh, detail. I, I think it was Amy McCann that said that, he put it quite beautifully, um, the material base of loyalism, when he said it was like tuppence hate me looking down on tuppence. Do you know what I mean? That was the kind, there was a, there was, there was some, there was, there was, there was, there was hate money in it. Um, it was still meant that, you know, if you were a, a, an engineering worker in Schultz factory uh, in uh, the six counties, you're still worse off than a, same, someone doing the same job uh, in Birmingham. But that's how they kind of maintained that thing. But I think you went into our kind of, it's the symbolism some, but is there any more than that? Um, and also, what are the opportunities um, I mean, yeah, we'll probably go into meeting after meeting now where people are talking about the lowest level of struggles and so on. 
what are the opportunities as well in terms of you know building militant strike action and struggle? Is there any difference in in, in terms of opportunities around Northern Ireland? Any anything that you kind of uh, see there? Just fi one final thing, and that is this. Um, I don't know if people. Saw, I thought Angela Rayner was wonderful the other day. Like her her line the other day was terrific, where she said uh, she said uh, Arlene Foster, the most expensive right winger since Cristiano Ronaldo. I thought that was terrific. <laughs> Okay, thanks. The comrade um, at the back um, will be followed by the comrade here. Um, hi, um, from Manchester. Um, thanks very much, Colm, because it's, it's really important, isn't it, that we know exactly what we're dealing with with the DUP now. Um, and that was a really comprehensive way of getting to grips with it, I thought. Um, and I was interested when you talked about the, um, the way in which the DUP hold up the principles of Protestant identity, because they are intrinsically loyal to the ruling class of Britain. That's in the fabric of their history. And part of that is about protecting the flag. It's about protecting the Union Jack. And I remembered when you were talking about when I watched The Wind That Shakes the Barley, how the fighters who never surrendered, if you like, to British rule, talked about the Union Jack as the butcher's apron. And when I saw the movie, I was sitting beside a friend of mine from Jamaica, and she dug me in the side. She said, we call it that, we call it that. Because the history of colonialism runs very deep. And Ireland was the first colony. And the DUP now carries traces of that history right into the present day. So we need to understand that <clears throat> in terms of how we deal with it. And the question I wanted to ask you was about the extent to which the DUP involves, accommodates, includes fascists. You talked about the... Um, politicians and the police being involved in loyalist paramilitarism. But also we know that fascists have been involved in that. One little anecdote from 2010, in the lead up to the national demonstration by the EDL in Bolton, the week before, one of the leading members of the UVF attacked a UAF planning meeting or tried to attack a UAF planning meeting in Manchester in the Friends Meeting House. And it was really funny because people had an idea that they might be around and spotters were there to make sure that they didn't get in. And when they came into the Friends Meeting House, they went, where's, where's the anti-fascists? Where's the anti-fascists? People said, they're not in here. They, this is the leader from one of the paramilitary groups from the north of Ireland. Strode right, in, right into the Friends Meeting House in Manchester, straight into Slimming World. And actually, what I wanted to just remember, really, was the, consequent, the following week, when that was stopped, the tradition that you talked about, about how we beat them. That's how we beat them. Trade unionists, shoulder to shoulder with local Muslim people, shoulder to shoulder with anti-racists and anti-fascists. That's how we beat them. We beat them in number. So I suppose my question is, at this moment in time, I mean, I'm aware of the fact that, for example, in Rochdale, the British First have called a demonstration very soon. My question really is about how important is it for us to integrate our intelligence about the DUP and about their relationship to the British government inside of what we do to drive the fascists back into the sewers? Um, the comrade here and then um, at the back. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most tragic things since the um, Belfast Agreement is the amount of peace walls in Belfast has actually doubled since the Belfast Agreement than what it was prior to the ceasefire. And it looks like sectarian has gone up. And I think we can relate it directly to austerity. 
When the Belfast Agreement was signed, it was in the middle of a boom, especially in the south of Ireland with the Celtic Tiger and the, and the different parties around the agreement, the British, the Irish government, the Americans, etc., sort of wanted this boom to continue into the north, prosperity to keep happening. And it hasn't happened. We're not in a boom. We've actually gone the other way, and austerity has gone worse. And the unionist community, the Protestant community, they look on it now that their lives are worse than pr prior to the Belfast Agreement. And th they're probably right because um, the, the standard of living has gone down. Now, a lot of them believe that what they had has gone to the working class um, Catholic community, which of course is wrong. Um, unemployment figures are probably still slightly worse for the Catholic community. Maybe in Belfast it's around about the same. And the housing waiting list is certainly still um, more Catholics on it, etc. But there is like a growing educated middle class Catholic community. And if you look at like places like Malone Road, which is a very affluent area of Belfast, that is now predominantly Catholic. But the DUP, if you can't offer your working class community um, prosperity, then you need to offer them something else. And what they've done, I think they've offered a bogeyman. And they've offered like that Sinn the Catholic community, they're the bad people. And if you vote for Sinn Féin, et cetera, uh, this is what you're going to get and you must vote for us. And that we've seen them become the dominant unionist party to, to the uh, deterrent of the Ulster unionists. But I think it is quite promising when we look at the... Um, Trade unionists in Ireland, it's at 36%. It's higher than the south of Ireland. It's higher than anywhere in the UK. So every single day, working class Catholics and Protestants are going to work together and organising together. And I do think that's the way forward. And uh, like Colin pointed out, it, um, the, the workers are there, the workers are organised. But the, less, the level of struggle needs to be upped by, uh, by the unions because every time we see the level of struggle um, at a high, sectarian lowers, sectarianism um, lowers. And I think that's a challenge now to, to the unions in Ireland. And again, uh, um, just to finally, last point to touch on the tremendous work that people before profit are doing. Um, to the fact Sinn Féin, you can see Sinn Féin, Féin is scared of them. They call them Brits, etc. And why would you take your place in, in Parliament? But I don't remember them saying that to Bernard De uh, Devlin um, when, when she took her place in Parliament. So, um, yeah, I think that, that is the one hope. And, of course, we do want to get rid of the border because the border in Ireland is a deterrent to working class people coming together. But we don't want to just collapse one rotten state in the north into another rotten state in the south. Yeah, of course, we want, to, we want a united Ireland, but we want a united Ireland in, in the vision that James Connolly had. And I, I think that's the, um, the aim for working class people. Thanks, Colm, for the excellent introduction. I had um, three questions, and they're quite wide-ranging. Um, I suppose as socialists, I uh, just wanted to ask how we should react when Tories start criticising um, uh, right-wing members um, of the DUP over their social policies. quite staggering when Tories start criticising um, people who seem to be more right-wing on social policies like abortion. Um, secondly, and perhaps more seriously, um, what are the long-term consequences and implications for the resurrection of the Stormont Parliament and the Northern Ireland government um, with the DUP effectively now propping up the Tories in Westminster? And the final question is, also in terms of Brexit, what are the implications um, for, uh, for Brexit in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, in terms of, again, the DUP now propping up um, this ramshackle Tory government? Right, John Mullen, you're from Dublin. Um, some of the questions that have been asked, you can read some answers to in the Irish Socialist Worker, the back page, a little plug uh, there. Uh, I just, uh, first thing I wanted to say, um, that um, the comment about the material base of unionism, Eamon McCann's famous phrase about Tuppence Hapney looking uh, down on Tuppence, over the years, because of the changing structures of capitalism and because of austerity and so on, that is even less than a halfpenny now. I don't know how you'd calculate it, but it's, it's still 
just there, differential rates of discrimination and so on, but less there, and therefore, you know, it has become more and more flags and identity and more and more the, the reactionary uh, 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 agenda and so on. But it does mean that there's an underlying crisis of unionism. Now, you might not think that if you look at the recent election, because the recent election was in the North completely polarized election. Both the DUP and Sinn Féin had a massive interest in making it so, in turning it into a sectarian headcount, and to some extent they were successful. There was only one seat in Northern Ireland that didn't go to DUP or Sinn Féin. SDLP, the old party of John Hume, eliminated. Official unionists eliminated. One independent right-wing uh, unionist was elected. Other than that, it was only DUP uh, uh, and Sinn Féin. And in both cases, the logic was, vote for us or you'll get Sinn Féin, vote for us or you'll get DUP. The bitter problem with that logic is that the more Protestants vote DUP and Catholics vote Sinn Féin, the more everything stays the same. Because they then eventually, after all sorts of bargaining and so on, do a deal as they have done be before and all implement austerity and so on. So this appears to be voting for the lesser evil or voting for your side, but nothing changes doing that. But in that context, you have to say, um, I didn't really realize he was here, so <laughs> but in that election, Jerry Carroll, in West Belfast, the heartland of Sinn Féin, Jerry Adams got 4,000 votes in a first-past-the-post uh, election. That is a stunning uh, achievement. And when it was proportional representation in the um, elections for uh, the assembly, the devolved assembly, of course, Jerry was elected. We ran two candidates in West Belfast. Our second candidate, uh, uh, Mick Collins, got over 1,000 votes. Uh, uh, and so on. It's a fantastic achievement. I just think, uh, uh, you have to say a, just a little bit about how it was done. Uh, all right. Of course it was done with the argument for a socialist Ireland, with the argument against um, the Sinn, Sinn Féin's deal with the, the DUP and the implementation of austerity and so on. It was also done by campaigning uh, massively over big political questions like Palestine. Uh, you know, w people before profit led a uh, huge Can campaign in solidarity up, with Palestine and so on. And, but it was also done by relentless campaigning on the ground. The, I, I haven't got time to say about the trade union struggle, very important, but it was also done by relentless campaigning on the ground. If you saw on Facebook, where was Jerry Carroll today? He was defending a community center on the Falls Road and defending a community center on the Shankill Road. And so on. I just, as an example, but that was every day. You know, and a fantastic amount of grassroots campaign combined with the, the, uh, the big politics. But I just, I just want to, to emphasize that now, the argument why you had to implement you austerity, to yeah, last sentence. The argument why you had to inter, uh, defend, implement austerity was there was no money. Yeah, except, yeah. <laughs> except when we needed it to prop up the doors. Then suddenly there was loads of money. That will create, a, that's a good cutting edge argument going forward. Um, after this, comrade, the woman um, there, um, yeah, you, and then I think that's going to be it to give um, Colm time to sum up. So sorry for all the people that have indicated. Uh, Jerry Carl, People Before Profit, and if you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and we'll be talking in detail about the elections in West Belfast at four o'clock. So if you want to know more about that, come along. Uh, but I just wanted to touch on some of Colm's points. I think it was great. Uh, to talk about the fractures and splits within uh, unionism. And it's worth saying there's a permanent crisis of, uh, of unionism in the North. Um, historically, they could promise and uh, to some extent uh, give jobs to Protestant working class people uh, in shipyards. Um, they could have done that you know, 50, 60 years ago, but unionism uh, can't deliver that uh, today. They can't deliver for working class people. And even the, the discussions and negotiations about the extra one billion pounds, you know, that's um, going to go to probably our community, as in the, the unionist uh, community, but it's going to be safened off through loyalist paramilitaries who are claimed and uh, presented as uh, representatives and spokespeople of the working class, but they're middle class uh, bosses uh, and managers. And I think the, the contrast between the Anglo-Irish Agreement uh, in 1985, uh, where they had 100,000 people on the streets of Belfast, unionism uh, delivered that. Contrast that with the flag protest. The flag protest uh, only a couple of years ago, the biggest demonstration was 2,000 people on the streets of Belfast. Now, 2,000 people who were quite 
uh, how would you say, <laughs> anti-nationalist, anti-republican, and one of the, the union jack to go back up in City Hall, but quite small in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, proportions. So I think it's quite important to understand that unionism, unionism is, is quite deep, uh, quite weak um, uh, at the minute. And also the contradictions between uh, the DUP and uh, Protestant working class people on a range of issues. You know, the DUP are deeply homophobic uh, party, homophobic organisation, but lots of... Um, uh, gay people um, are out on parade every single year. The, the demonstration last week in Belfast with 20,000 people calling for marriage equality. People from all parts of Belfast were on that. So big, big contradictions. The DUP are obviously deeply against abortion and against women's rights, but uh, even 25% of their own voters are for reform uh, in regards to abortion law. So that there, and also the fact that when it comes to Israel, the DUP are um, staunch supporters of Israel, but when we called uh, demonstrations uh, around Palestine, like John was saying, with people from the Schenkel Road coming on the demonstrations and marching to the US Embassy. So big, big contradictions. And just in terms of the left, what we can do, there was a campaign last year around a drill um, just outside Antrim, um, Woodburn Forest, and they were drilling for uh, to find sort of oil or gas. Uh, and this was next to a reservoir for working class people's water, um, their reservoir, um, their drinking water, where it came from, in the Shankill and on the falls. And for us, obviously, it was a environmental issue, but also it was an issue about class. And we went in, we organised a meeting on the falls and a meeting on the shankle to say, listen, this is about the environment, this is about you know climate change, but also this is about working class people's water and the, the right to decent water. So the left can do that in Belfast, and that's what people before profit are uh, engaged in. Just maybe one last point is the, the idea of the peace process. I think it's quite important to talk about because there's an argument to say about, you know, why does Britain need to have, or does it still have an interest in Ireland in the north? I think it does, and I think one of the biggest exports for the British state is the peace process. When Tony Blair was really uh, unpopular, uh, the thing that he was sort of uh, grabbing onto was the peace process, the peace process, the peace process. So maybe, Colin, if you can maybe touch upon how that's kind of ingrained in Canadian. Thanks. Sorry, yeah, uh, I'm in People Before Profit in the South, um, and we were campaigning for Jerry up in the North uh, during the last elections, and it was extraordinary, actually, the, um, you know, the, 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 the shit that was thrown at, at Jerry uh, by, in particular, Sinn Féin. Uh, there was leaflets went around the place, uh, uh, he's a baby killer because of a pro-abortion studs. Um, on there, they, they did a fantastic postering job, you have to hand it to them, uh, how the people be before profit at the DUP want to deliver a hard border. In other words, you know, put the border post up it's, uh, again. Really, you know, as much spearing uh, of people before profit and Jerry as possible um, because they fear them. They fear us, um, and they're right to, because we are making, you know, we're, we're, we're able to exploit the logical cracks of, uh, of the divisions that have been, uh, that they try to set between uh, Protestant and Catholic workers. There is a fantastic unity among the right wing uh, of the Protestant Catholics. Um, so, for instance, the Brook Centres, uh, places that were giving, uh, you know, contraception abortion advice to, to, to young people, uh, it was combined Catholic and Protestant bigots that stood outside them and tried to have them closed down. Uh, no problem, you know, with, with, with unity there. But one of the things that they, that they also try to do is now is make out that there's a, a real cultural divide. You know, that, that uh, a Protestant culture is being disrespected uh, because there's all this emphasis on the Irish language. Now, you know, you can say, well, what relevance does the Irish language have? People want to speak it, they should be able to speak it. It has actually a resonance going way back where it was, it was handy in the jails. The screws didn't know what you were talking about if you learned it, and that's why they did. You know, and so there's bits, you know, like that about it. But, you know, the notion that we should be respecting the, the, the uh, you know, the sort of the, um, the culture of sectarianism coming from that horrible orange tradition is like, you know, saying, that we should be respecting the gallant South's tradition of lynching. You know, it's it's this is part and parcel of what that uh, what that group and order stood for, and is to to be totally uh, disrespected. Um, there were a couple of other points I was going to make, but sorry, I'm too long-winded about it. Thanks.
Okay, um, sorry, I know that there were other people who did want to speak, um, but just before I bring Colin back to sum up, um, I just wanted to remind people um, who perhaps it's their first Marxism is that there are picnics um, at the back of this building at dinner time. There is hot food available at the gallery um, in this building downstairs. And also just to remind people that this evening there are two... Um, music events, one by Jimmy Ross and one by Brian Richardson, um, both um, looking at music of resistance. So we'd encourage people to stay and come along to that. So, Colin. Um, thanks very much for the discussion. I thought that was very, very interesting. I absolutely agree with the point that Jerry made uh, about uh, about the decline. Do you know what I mean? It has to be said. I mean, I remember sort of 90, 96, 97, 98, times of the huge crisis around the Drum Cree march in, 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 in Portadown. Do you know, so the, 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 there was this feeling that, that you know, sort of the uh, loyalists could mobilise and bring the whole of the North to, to a standstill. Do you know what I mean? I, I think the police stood back and let them do it. But, you know, you saw at the heart of that, I mean, you just think about sort of what was going on at the heart of, the, of those protests. An absolute psychopath like Billy Wright, who was the head of the Ulster Volunteer Force, the Ulster Volunteer Force and the PUP have been trying to move, uh, the leadership generally have been moving and been encouraged to move in the direction of the peace process. R Billy Wright was deliberately encouraged to break away, from, uh, break away from them by people like Paisley, by Trimble as well, who were also having secret meetings with him in the grounds of Drum Creek Church and then a Catholic taxi driver gets murdered in the, in the middle of that process as a warning to say, this is what we're prepared to, to deliver if you don't force, force this march through. So th it's incredible what, 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 you know, to compare it to that and absolutely right to see the, 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 numbers that, the, the, the numbers have declined. I think it has to be said though, and I think this point has to be always hammered home, especially for socialists thinking about ourselves and the labour movement, the working class movement and so on, is to ask yourself what the labour the government's role was in all that. It was 1998 that Mo Molum forced the march down through, uh, the Drum Cree march down through Portadown as a sop to the unionists, thinking that this, would, this is the thing that would uh, let, uh, let, 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 let the peace process take shape. It was her that went in and met Johnny Adair, that head case from the UDA in North Belfast, who was on a killing spree and organising a killing spree in order to try and bring down the, 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 the peace process, in order to try and stir up uh, conflict again. He, she went in and met him in the, in, in, in the prisons and said this is a great uh, th th thing for peace. The other thing, I had to, I had to, I, I, before I just get the other point about progressive loyalism, is I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it, I'm finding it hard to contain my anger remembering this, is that, Gore, I don't know if you remember this, but in about 2005, 2006, maybe slightly later than that, Gordon Brown called for homecoming parades for British soldiers coming back from uh, Iraq. They didn't cause an awful big stir in, in, in Britain. Do you know what I mean? There was a couple of sort of different, you know, sort of garrison towns would have them and all that sort of stuff. In the north of Ireland, this was very, very significant. And the DUP and Belfast City Council and Ballymena and all those sorts of places, places said, we're going to have the biggest homecoming parade ever of you, uh, uh, for, for, for British troops. Why was that significant? In Belfast, there was a massive anti-war movement. We had a march in Belfast on the 15th of February 2003 that brought together, it must have been 25, 30, 40,000 know, uh, people. I remember it was the same size. It felt like the same size as those big monster rallies that Paisley used to have in the 80s. And somebody actually had a sign saying, Ulster says no, and I thought that was a really lovely wee, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But there was loads of, as Jerry said, you know, all those things, loads of people from Protestant background on it. People really, really united about it. Isn't this great? Now we're talking about international politics. We're not letting people divide us. Well, what happened with the homecoming parade? All of that unity was smashed because what the DUP called, brought into question was said, no matter what you might think of Tony Blair and his decision to go to a war in Iraq, what we've got to do now is support our troops. No matter, no, no matter what, we just have to support our troops. And they drew the lines again. You could see it. Thousands of loyalists, when we end up to sort of have a counter protest, Thousands of loyalists with uh, uh, Union Jacks and all that sort of stuff, goading, you know, sort of people from, uh, national, uh, from, from West Belfast, people like the Bally Murphy families who'd come down and said, there shouldn't be any, you know, sort of homecoming parade for British soldiers. Our families were murdered by, by British soldiers and we're going to challenge. But, they, they, but the DUP successfully tried to smash that movement. And this is what, the, you see, this... I, I, I think this, this is the thing that we've got to sort of try, try, try and uh, grasp also uh, about, uh, about unionism. 
you, you see, even though it declines and even though it's small and even though there's splits and there's a crisis and I'm absolutely right to, to grasp that crisis, I mean, I find it really fascinating over the last 20 years, the conversations I've had with people who are loyalists, people who are trade unionists, some people. I remember having this really fascinating uh, uh, discussion one time with, uh, after a trade union meeting with a guy called Billy Mitchell, who's a former brig brigadier in the UVF, a long-time loyalist prisoner. But at that time was writing sort of joint magazines with ex-Republican prisoners, trying to explore the ideas of socialism and labor politics and all this sort of stuff and where could we go in the peace process. One of the key movers in the, P in the UVF in the direction of the PUP and all that sort of stuff. And I remember we were sitting down sort of in, uh, in a pub in Belfast and he said, you know, I would describe myself as a British Republican. I'm against the monarchy. Do you know what I mean? Said, this is what I would say. You know, I can't describe myself as an Irish Republican. I just can't get that put all together. But when it comes to British politics, I say I'm a Republican. I don't want that. I don't want the monarchy. I'm for la Labour politics. So all, all this is really fascinating. And you could see that the, all those contradictions uh, sort of uh, uh, exist and are magnified in so many different ways with people who are involved in trade union and left-wing politics, uh, uh, left left politics in the north of Ireland. But the great danger is that that all collapses the moment that there's a, there, there's a question of a challenge to the state, the moment that there's a question of, uh, of, a, challenge, of a challenge to, to, to identity. You see, the PUP, for example, styles itself as progressive loyalists, basic Labour Party politics. I remember one of the first demonstrations when Storm had, uh, got established was something that we'd organ helped organize to demand a woman's right to choose, the uh, extension of the 1967 Abortion Act. It was a very strange thing because you went up to Storm and a few hundred of us went in and lobbied and then all of a sudden you're seeing all these politicians and all these politicians just came out of it. They didn't know exactly how the proper way to do it. So they just all walked out of the parliament, came down and started talking to our demonstration. I remember Billy Hutchinson and from the PUP, former UVF commander and all that, came down, absolutely with you. We agree that 1967 abortion that should, should be applied to the, 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 the north of Ireland. Sinn Féin were coming down and humming and hand. They weren't really sure about it because they're always making a concession to the Catholic, uh, Catholic position and so on. But I thought, isn't this really fascinating? This is sort of like opening up all those contradictions when you start looking at those questions. But then what happens the next week? No, Martin McGuinness is made Minister of Education. And he takes down the Union Jack outside the, the Ministry of Education at Newton Arts. And who's leading the demonstration to get it back up? Billy Hutchinson. Do you know what I mean? So and this is what happens all the time. The Twaddell Avenue march in North Belfast, which is now the key flashpoint in North Belfast, and they want to make it the key flashpoint. You have the demonstrations that happen there. They're addressed by Billy Hutchinson. The local, U then the local UVF commander from the Shanko Road, then the DUP politician, then the Ulster Unionist politician, and it's all calls for, oh yeah, people are very, very, Protestant working class people are being ignored and abandoned and all that, we must have unionist unity, get round table talks, be brought into storm and talk about how the, how the, how the loyalist working class is losing out. So those politics constantly fail, that, that politics of progressive loyalism constantly fails, why we need, it's any, even more a reason why we need, uh, why, why, why we need socialist politics. But Red is, it's interesting that the, the discussion you have, Red, and it's, it's a whole other meeting to sort of talk about those, those questions of fascism. Yes, there's, there's impulses in, 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 in Ulster, lo, Ulster loyalism, but I, it's too simple to say that. I mean, I, very interesting conversations. The BNP tried to set up a headquarters in, uh, in, in East Belfast one time. Um, and it was the UVF went down, put a gun on the table and said, get out of town. Do you know what I mean? So there's, a, there's an interesting thing, although, you know, sort of, you know, the UDA have had links with Combat 18 and all that sort of stuff. And all those, all that loyalist football chanting is on, no surrender to the IRA and all that. So there's, you know, there's crossovers, but I wouldn't, I'm not sure how much you would put it. But I think the method that you talked about, the method of, that socialists argue for within the trade union movement is that whenever fascism or whenever, you know, sort of the extreme right raise their head, what we have to try and do is to build a coalition that undermines their, their, their support, that wins people over, that asks people to take a side to be anti-sectarian, anti-racist, anti-fascist and so on and builds the broadest uh, unity on that basis. This is why we need socialist organisation because the great tragedy in the north of Ireland is that the trade union movement, who you would hope might provide that function, that when there is an outrage, when there is a sectarian killing and so on, would automatically uh, respond that way, doesn't automatically do that, especially when, it involves the, especially when it involves the state. Trade union movement in the north of Ireland, after Bloody Sunday happened, and seven of the people who were killed on Bloody Sunday were, were trade union members. They had a conference the, the, the following week, and they never even mentioned Bloody Sunday. 
They never even mention it, never mind doing, so, doing something about it and taking the side of the oppressed and standing with the oppressed and so on and, 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 and challenging it. This, and this is, a, and, and, and this is, this is a, a, a big question. I, want to, sorry, I just want to touch on, before I finish, this question of how do we, how do we get change? How do we convince working class Protestants to be involved in a project of a change, change in society? And I think it has to be said, the shift of Sinn Féin's strategy from the mili military campaign to now a, basically a charm offensive, you know, so we'll say that we'll disarm the, 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 the unionists by being so nice uh, uh, to, to them and going shaking the Queen's hand and all that, so, and they won't be able to hold us up as a great uh, en enemy. Do you know what I mean? And you know, that, that, this is you know, part of this, that, that whole thing, and Jerry's absolutely right, this peace process as an industry is incredible. Martin McGuinness, God rest his soul, was, you know, it was out in Iraq, sort of saying, I'll bring the two sides together, because I've been, you know, after the devastation of a major imperialist war, you know, so the British government sent Martin McGuinness in, 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 into the middle of it and say, he's got this experience of talking to former enemies, and that's a, you know, that's an absolute sheer madness, you know what I mean? But that's, that, that, that's the, the, the nature of, 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 that, of that industry. But you see, I don't think that ever, that, that, that uh, campaign, uh, or that sort of change in strategy uh, uh, by, uh, by, by Sinn Féin, and especially the, the extent to which it is, it is aimed at convincing Protestant or unionist businesses, unionist businessmen, business leaders and all that sort of stuff, that their interests lie in, in the south of Ireland, will never appeal, I don't think, to, 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 to working class Protestants. This is the thing that we, uh, th th this is the thing I think we need to, uh, need, need to focus on. And I think it means that rather than a treat treating the unionist identity or orange culture as some part of the, of the intrinsic identity of people who happen to be born Protestant in, in the north of Ireland. I think we have to openly challenge it as, mu uh, as much as we can. It's, people are absolutely right to say, you know, sort of, that, I mean, Pat made that mention, and I heard a lot of people being shocked that, oh, I hear that the, you know, the BBC in Northern Ireland are going, to, are, are going to cover the Orange Marches this year. They said, but sure, they do that every year. You know, we have a whole bloody day and then a roundup at the end of the night about all these. But it is the most narrow version of, pro of, of, of Protestant culture, the most narrow, narrow version. You only have to think about Van Morrison, who's an East Belfast, Northern Ireland Protestant, but who was open to the whole world and soul music and all that, all that, that, that sort of stuff, and Irish music and Irish traditional music, you know, to see how, narrow, uh, see how narrow it is, and uh, such, a, such a narrow uh, version of it. But you're absolutely right. The, the reason it's narrow is that because it's, a, it's, it's, a, it, it's about the tradition of British colonialism and militarism. You know, we think about it and the contradictions that uh, that, that, that raises. World War I, the, 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 the Loyalist, mo Loyalist movement are, and the Orange Order continually commemorate the Battle of the Somme in the, in, in the First World War. This is when the UVF, that had been set up to, to challenge Home Rule, went en masse into, into the British Army and was led to its slaughter in the trenches, uh, in the trenches of the Somme by the ridiculous generals who, uh, who, who, who led the British Army. But what... But what the, what the Orange Order and what Loyalist organizations do is celebrate that. This is our great blood sacrifice. Instead of having, you know, the alternative tradition, which emerged amongst working class Protestants in Belfast after the war, to say, we reject the horrors of the war, we're out for radical social change, we're on all that sort of stuff. Instead, they narrow it, sorry, to that narrow militarist, uh, narrow militarist, mil mil militarist uh, tradition of marching bands and all that sort of stuff, flags and uh, emblems, uniforms and all that sort of stuff. They, that's a narrowing of the culture of, uh, of working class Protestants. And I think we have to place our hope on the fact that we can appeal to, that socialists can appeal and bring together uh, working class Protestants on a vision that appeals to that much wider vision, open vision, progressive vision, uh, radical uh, so, so, social vision uh, in, in order to create a united Ireland. I remember being so impressed, Jerry, with when you got elected to the Belfast City Council and I came up to the victory rally in West Belfast and it was packed, there was hundreds of people there, but one of the people who got up and spoke there was a woman from the uh, Sandy Row, you know, a very deeply loyal, loyalist area. And she said, I'm so delighted to see you elected, Jerry. We have been working for years with you in the Sandy Row and in West Belfast over housing issues and all that sort of stuff. Said, we, have, we need the same politics in the Sandy Row. We have difficulties because the UDA are hand in glove with every landlord and rack rent and landlord and all that sort of stuff. It's not easy, but this is the sort of politics that we need in our place too. And I, I, it's so... 
the alternative will come out of those practical day-to-day -day struggles. You know, that's what we have to build up. But it means being clear in your politics as well, never make it a concession to that sectarian division that, and the, what the peace process does lock in that, 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 that sectarian division so that it can't be shifted for, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll forever remain. We need to reject it and challenge it and build a, a, and, and build a movement based on, based on those com common interests with that wider vision of, of a socialist area. Now, I just want to finish on this. I know we've kept you late. Yeah. Shit. Um, <laughs> but I do want to finish on this because this is not a new thing. What was being reborn with people before profit and, uh, uh, and, uh, and what's been done in Ireland is very, very significant. It's the re-emergence of a tradition, a socialist tradition that was submerged in, uh, in, in, in Irish politics and was uh, and which the British state tried to kill off by executing James Connolly after the 1916, uh, after the 1960 Easter Rising. If you ever get a chance to do it, I really encourage you to, to read Connolly's Labour and uh, Labor uh, Irish History. What he does is, and he returns again and again to the history of Ireland and the social movements that tried to resist uh, home rule and the movements that tried, tried to repress them, what he returns time and time again to is that the central question is who controls the wealth Who's exploiting who? That the key division is between the tiny minority that, that, that exploit us all and, 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 the people who, and the people who are exploited. And he said, he, he talks about how so many of the movements that emerged ended up being led by people who, who, never, who never grasped this and that, that socialists need to do it. I'll just want to finish with the final sort of paragraph from it. And he said, these men, these leaders, to arouse the passions of the people, invoke the memory of social wrongs, such as evictions and famines. But for these wrongs, they proposed only political remedies, such as changes in taxation or transference of the seat of government, of class rule, from one country to another. Hence, they accomplished nothing because the political remedies proposed were unrelated to the social subjection at the root of the matter. The revolutionists of the past were, uh, were wiser. The Irish socialists are wiser today in their movement the North and South will again clasp hands. Again, it will be demonstrated, as it was in 1798 with the United Irishmen, that the pressure of a common exploitation can make a co an enthusiastic rebels out of a Protestant working class, earnest champions of civil and religious liberty out of Catholics, and out of both a united social democracy. That's the vision, I think, that we have to link ourselves to. Thanks.